Welcome to Financial Planning Explained, and I'm your host, Mike Menninger, Certified Financial Planner, owner and founder of Menninger & Associates Financial Planning. Uh, of the six areas of financial planning, the one that is absolutely integrated with every other one is tax planning, because it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. And as we approach year end, uh, there's a lot of things that you want to do before the end of the year uh, so that you can accomplish it because after December 31st, guess what? There's not a whole lot that you can actually do, particularly from the individual. Some businesses can do a few things. I am joined here. This is part two of two. Uh, I'm here also with Brian Puglisi, uh, certified public accountant, CPA, and a ma has a master's in taxation. And with, is it GMS? GMS Surgeon. GMS Surgeon. Yep. Okay, located in Pennsylvania or what? Is it Devon? Uh, Devon? Devon, okay. PA. So we're going to pick right up where we left off. We're looking for uh, year-end tax planning ideas. Uh, Brian, a couple other things we talked about. Why don't you throw one out at me? Yeah, so this one is it's also fairly easy. Probably somewhat overlooked would be the Pennsylvania, which is n somewhat stingy with deductions. One, of the de one deduction that they provide is contributions to a 529 plan. Right. So... What we're, ta what we're talking about here is it's not huge, huge dollars, but it's, I think it's worth it for certain, for certain taxpayers definitely to consider this. So a contribution of up to 15000 into a 529 per taxpayer, per spouse, to the, expense, to the extent that they have the P uh, sufficient PA income to cover that. So 15000 taxpayer spouse per Beneficiary, so Her whether beneficiary, that's ch right. child, grandchild, it, it can it could be your neighbor's kid. It doesn't really matter. Uh, con those contributions are deductible on the PA tax return, and if, just to th throw out dollars, if it's taxpayer and spouse each put fifteen thousand in for one person, that's a thirty thousand dollar. It's a lot of money, but it's the Pennsylvania tax savings on that will be rounded three hundred or excuse me nine hundred dollars. So it's, it's something to think about if you have the financial wherewithal to, to do that or if you're planning on making contributions to, or if you're planning on building up a 529 for future education. And just a, two quick asides, one is a, a reminder that the, the IRS now allows up to 10,000 per year from a 529 distribution plan, distribution to K through 12 like a private or parochial school. Right, which is basically has eliminated, the, has made the dinosaur mm -hmm. obsolete the education savings accounts, which are now called covered else. Yep. I mean, so those things are gone. Yep, and so the, and the, the benefit of, all, of, or one other benefit of kind of a hidden benefit of all this is, let's just say you're, you're saying, oh, well, I are, um, my, my kid is going to go to college next year and I have a big, account I have, I have money for them but it's not in a 529 you can for lack of a better term funnel the, the funds from your regular account through a 529 plan and again a pass through. This, it's allowed it's, it's a pass through it's allowed put it into the 529 plan don't bring it out the next day but le let it yeah they want to have it in there so we've done that many many times before Brian it's funny you say that because you know I call it a pass through yep you know it could be my, my child's going to college in a month. I'm like, okay, you take $30,000 or $15,000 or whatever that dollar amount might be. You know, they're going to school anyway. You're spending the money anyway. You open up a 529 plan, but make sure, too, the investments. Because there are certain 529s, when you contribute, you have to pay a fee. Yep. And you have to pay a fee to pull out. And the last thing you want to do is put it into an investment and have it go down. You put it into money market, there's no cost to buy it, no cost to sell it. And you're effectively just putting it in and pulling right back out. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's any time during the year. So in, that, in theory, I may have in February or January paid $10,000 for my child's education. Mm -hmm. And then in September, it's like, hey, you know what? I got an idea. I'm going to put $10,000 in and pull it right back out again. I get the tax deduction as long as it matches up during the same year. Yep, correct. That's the win. It's win-win. You know, he who knows the rules of the game usually does better right. in the game. That's what I always say. 
Um, capital gains and losses is also. Yeah, something to, th to think about. If, if in your account you have, so, so in your investment account you have winners and losers, although probably in this market most people More have winners. mostly winners. But there's something called capital loss harvesting. And it's what you do, or what the, what you, the financial advisor uh, in conjunction, probably with the tax professional and also um, with, with the, the, the client would look through the account and determine if they're, if, if they're at a net capital gain for the year. And it, it, it isn't a bad investment decision to sell a, a loser to bring the total of the account down lower. Right, you mean the capital gains. The Correct. capital gains lower. Correct. I've actually harvested capital gains. There are times when a client may actually <clears throat> be in a lower income tax bracket. Yep. You know, if their if their adjusted gross income is under 105 or if their taxable income is under 80 for married, you know, say they're retired or whatever and, and their income is lower, you could take capital gains and pay 0%, my Correct. favorite tax rate. Correct. What's your favorite tax rate? Z zero. It is about that. See, we agree on that one. So there are a lot of times, and um, and, and if you're, you're monkeying with the tax, tax laws, and you just got to be careful, mm -hmm. the difference between short-term and long-term. Correct. You don't want to be taking short-term capital gains if you can avoid it. Correct, because they're generally going to be taxable at your ordinary rate, which is often l l higher than your capital, long-term capital gains. Actually, it's always, it's always higher. Than it's, 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 always, it's not even ever the same. It's always higher, except yep. if it's zero, yep. which, you know, you have to really pull that. So capital gains, uh, you know, gains mm -hmm. and loss harvesting is uh, certainly something that should be done um, or at least looked at and evaluated and like i said there are many times we actually intentionally take capital gains correct you know and i've done and it's legal i've t in a case where somebody was paying zero percent capital gain but i didn't want to get rid of the investment you know what i did i sold it and bought it same day correct because that is allowed that is allowed because they're there they allow you to post a gain but Wash sale. Wash, well, wash sale is it's, if you sell at a loss, you can't buy it back. For 30 uh, days. For 30 days. Right. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> is this allowed? If I sold it at a loss, let's say I like a particular stock. I sell it at a loss in my individual account. Can I, inside of 30 days, buy it in my IRA or Roth IRA? I don't. I don't think so. Not supposed to. Yeah, you're not supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll leave that one alone. Right. All right, so by rule, no. Right, but it maybe sell, if you, if you think it, if you want to stay in a market sector, maybe you would sell Coca-Cola and buy Pepsi if you think both of those stocks are, right. from an investment standpoint, the same. Right, okay, that's, that's another way of doing it. Mm -hmm. You're right, okay. Um, got any other ideas off the top of your head? Uh, well, a reminder, a year-end reminder, everyone should be maxing out their 401k oh, good point. plan contribution. If, if, if they the want to the max. If they can, and if the employer has a match, because it's essentially free non-taxable money. If, right. If you don't lose an out on match, it's silly. Uh, one of the things that I have found a lot of times, I don't know if you noticed this, uh, we do for our clients <laughs> the year-end planning, we always ask them for their pay stubs. Mm -hmm. And... When we look at their pay stubs, you'd be surprised uh, how many people are significantly either under or over withholding for taxes. That's yep. number one. Number two is, as you pointed out, a lot of people are under withholding, and I, unless this is the first time I'm meeting them, trust me, they're not. They're getting a maximum match. But you'd be surprised how many people I run into who most companies do not match catch up. Right. And people don't realize they're contributing, let's say 10% or whatever the case may be, and they break through their 19,500 contribution limit, but then move right into the catch up. Mm -hmm. If they do that in the latter part of the year, they may be losing company match. Or if for some reason they wanted to contribute more, at the end of the year is the time to start jamming the 401k. And I do this a lot. I've had people who have a four, you know, their 401k and they have the Roth 401k and it's to their advantage to contribute to the Roth. 
And I've had them literally put 100% of their pay in the final two months to try to reach the limit. Right. They're like, but Mike, I'm not going to get a paycheck. By the way, I'm good at spending other people's money. Yeah, right. Um, and I'm like, that's fine. We have an investment account. If you're normally taking home $2,000 every two weeks or something like that, and you're plowing it into your 401k, fine. We take it out of your investment account and feed it back to you mm -hmm. because I would much rather see the money in the tax-free growth Roth mm -hmm. than in the taxable investment right. account. So a lot of that is taking a look at the pay stubs because the last thing you want to have is people substantially under withholding, and I've seen it. Do you see that a lot? We do. Um, we see under withholding and then, like you said, also o over withholding. So ideally, you, you, you don't want to over withheld and have the IRS give you a big refund at the, at, in next April. That's, that's not usually a recommended. It's, it's not necessarily good cash planning. And under withholding, uh, one of the benefits of if you're under withheld is a withholding is considered an annual concept. So if you're under withheld and it's towards the end of the year, and you want to raise your withholding, you can raise your withholding, and, and the IRS will consider it even if you... you as long as it's withholdings. Correct. As opposed to... Right, right, right. As opposed to estimated tax payments. Well, but then they have, if you... You know, the federal government wants you to give them the money. Otherwise, everybody will be paying on April 15th. Because if you don't give a certain Correct. amount... If it's withholding in the current year, yes. the year for which we're taught... The right. income is earned. Absolutely. But if you don't withhold enough from you're potentially subjecting yourself to a tax penalty. Yes. And that penalty is what, 5%? It's some, it, it could be more because there's an interest component of it right. too. There's multiple penalties and interest, but a rounded number, 5%. Right. So the other things that you do sometimes is you're monitoring <clears throat> income. And while this may be for lower income, but not even also the case, I find for Medicare planning, Medicare is the cliff ones, mm -hmm. meaning that if uh, a married couple, and the current number is 176,000, if they exceed 176,000, two years from now, both people's Medicare is going to go up. Right. That's a tax in itself. They go 176,001, guess what? Boom. <clears throat> so we do a lot of that monitoring too. So that can be very tricky, particularly if you have certain investments that you don't know what the in comes going to be Correct. until later, capital gains, distributions, yep. whatever Which the case may be. Which are always at the end of the year. I know. So that always, why do you think it makes this time of year such a, just a joy for us? <laughs> so radar break already this time. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few moments after we take this short break. Have you saved enough for retirement? Are you financially prepared for an emergency or unexpected event? Have you thought about your financial future? Hi, I'm Mike Manager, founder of Manager & Associates Financial Planning. For over 20 years, we have been answering our clients' questions just like these as we develop unique and comprehensive financial plans tailored to meet their needs. When addressing your financial plan, we incorporate your entire financial picture, including taxes, estate planning, as well as investment planning and retirement planning. So call us today for a complimentary, no obligation consultation. A unique approach to financial planning. Welcome back to Financial Plan and Explained. I'm Mike Manager, Certified Financial Planner, my, the host, your host, and I'm with Brian Puglisi, Certified Public Accountant. And we're continuing on with the year-end tax planning ideas. Uh, most of what we've done uh, in the last several segments is talking mostly about the individuals. Let's spend a little bit of time on the small corporations. What do you say? Sure. So give me some ideas that, that you typically will share uh, with your business owners. So if, for example, let's say the client is a cash basis taxpayer, which means they deduct expenses as they pay them, which includes well, let's keep it that way. If they just deduct expenses as they pay them, if, if they're at the year end, do small businesses go out and look for items, not just frivolously purchase thing, things, but assets that they need, whether it be... Um, <clears throat> I need a vehicle. If you need a vehicle is a good one, 
or new furniture or supplies or, or any type of bills. There, there, is, there are abilities out there to accelerate expenses into the current year to, to get the deduction in the current year. And what piggybacks off on that a little, Mike, Mike talked about vehicles, uh, so there's the depreciation concept. So the, the tax laws allow, th there's, there's two types of depreciation. There's bonus depreciation and 179 expensing. Without going into all the details, most big equipment purchases, the type of things such as this, this counter, which might be something that would be capitalized by an employer, it can usually or almost always be expensed immediately. Yeah, expensed. Isn't it like 100, 150,000 or something like that? What's that well, number? Well, bonus depreciation, there really there is no limit. 179, the limit. It, there, there is there's a, a limit on 179, and it, it's there's there's a it, it, it. I think it's up to it's over half a million, but it depends also on the magnitude of the f purchasing that you do. If you do too much, you won't qualify. There's also uh, if, if there's too much, if, there's, if you don't have business income, the 179 deduction doesn't normally work, the 179 expensing, so the bonus depreciation is the way to go, and there's very, um, well, very generous limits. Once again, it all comes down to tax planning, and yep. you know, by the sound of it, that's when you're trying to do projections yep. of what your income is this year and what you expect your income to be next year or even the next few years. Correct. Right, because, yeah. So we, we even have clients that if they expect to be in a higher bracket in the future, they, if they bought, they bought items like this, they would elect out of the bonus depreciation. So don't take it to intentionally push the depreciation to a future year when they know they will have higher income and therefore right. be in a higher marginal tax bracket. But I can basically pick, <clears throat> I'm asking this question, um, on a per thing, right? Not for bonus depreciation. Bonus, it's all five-year property or no five-year property. All seven-year property or no seven-year So in other words, what you're telling me is that I can't buy a truck and do a 179 expense and then buy another vehicle or another piece of equipment and bonus depreciate it? It's all or none or what? So so for bonus depreciation, it's all or none. That's where the 179 expensing comes in. If you, if you don't want to take blanket immediate expensing, immediate bonus deduction on all of your fixed asset purchases, you can pick and choose via the 179 expenses, assuming you're not over the, the limit, uh, the, the annual acquisition limit, and assuming... A you, limit per item or limit per... To total. Total, okay. Is that based Which upon is, what? Is it based upon the size of the business? I mean, it's not one size fits all, is it? No, and it, it, it's, it's, it, it's based on, it, the, the, the 179 calculations can get more complicated, but it's, it's, it's in the $2 million range. Of oh. it, it, once you, most people aren't going to be at that limit. Right, okay. So, and so if you are not at that limit and you have business income and you want to do like Mike said and pick and choose, that works okay. well with 179 expenses. And so you can make the purchase now and then decide when you do your taxes how you want to expense it. Co correct. So if I wanted to buy a truck, I may choose to buy it in December simply because it gives me the choice of deducting it this year or spread it out over time. But if I wait until January, I can't deduct it this year. Co correct, with the caveat that the, the asset has to be placed into service. So it, it has to be received by the business. Yeah, all right, right. I can't just buy the truck and have to wait for it. Right. Do, wait correct. six months for it to be delivered, correct. which is what's in, happening in this, here. Right, in this market. So what other things are, are you finding commonplace that the small business owners are doing this time of year or you're doing with your small business owners? Well, it's a reminder absolutely for self-employed people. So these are people who uh, have an ownership in an S corporation or a partnership and maybe they get a K-1. So they're, they're not, not necessarily compensated on a W-2, it depends, but there's different retirement pl uh, plan options. Like there's something called a SEP, yeah. which is a, um, for like income 
potentially from a partnership and it's again there's there's some calculations but it's 20 or 25 percent of the net yeah, earnings but the from SEP the doesn't need to be done but before december 31st though that's correct right that's correct. okay so i'm looking more towards year end so when you say that i have a client who is an s corp llc or s corp doesn't matter it kind of works the same way and what they do every december is they make their 401k contribution of $26,000. Yep. But what we do is we wait until December to determine whether or not it's going into traditional or whether or not it's going into the Roth. Right. And so then <clears> the profit sharing, once again, the profit sharing doesn't have to be done until the time that they actually file the taxes. Mm -hmm. So that's really not an issue. <clears throat> yep. And so, but the 401k piece has to be done by December 31st. Correct. What other, um, what other things do you have in mind that the business owners are doing? Um, well, we, we talked about expensing. Uh, well, here's one. Uh, if the business owners have employees, there is potentially like a profit sharing okay. plan to establish. Like, and this is, a, this is a common one that you would, you might say to yourself, well, why would a business owner it's, it's kind of a, a harsh thing to say, but why would a business owner want to share profits with the employees? Well, the answer to that is because a lot of times the business owners would rather share profits with their employees than uh, give it to, give the, it to the IRS. I, let me tell you something. I, I did the same mm -hmm. thing myself this past year and gave a very, very generous uh, profit sharing to the employees mm -hmm. for that reason. It was the weirdest thing in the world that... We sat down and literally said, all right, if I put $1,000 into the profit sharing plan, what happened? My tax went down by like 460 bucks. I'm like, holy smokes, I'm in a 46% tax bracket. Right. Kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. All of a sudden, zoop, it dropped to like 18%. Yeah. I'm like, all right, I stopped right there. Because you know what? I would much rather give that back to the employees than find half of it going to the government. And you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. I, you know, I'm also a believer too. Happy employees are productive employees. Absolutely. You know, and if you treat them well, they're going to treat you well. Yeah. Um, what other things do we have on our mind? Let me think. Um, my goodness, we do all kinds of things for year on tax planning. What other things do you have in mind? Well, we could talk about, and I, I don't want this is another thing that gets it gets technical, but uh, the qualified business income deduction, the 199A deduction. And, and what, all I'll say to that is certain types of businesses, flow through businesses, they right. talked about this a few years ago with the, with the election time, get a deduction equal to or up to 20% of the flow through income right. from the business. So there are ways to, to capitalize, to, to project out and capitalize on those amounts. Uh, okay. Th that would be its own session. You know what? It's funny you say that because this is a year in planning that I am doing, okay, is my taxable situation is going to be substantially different this year than it is going to be next year. And because of the QBI, it's going to be, what's that? One, one caveat. Uh -oh. Your industry and my industry generally don't qualify for this deduction. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> lawyers, accountants, uh, medical practices, financial advisors. There's a few. There's a few others, but okay. like a, like a manufacturer, a store owner, uh, lots of different. Uh, it, a lot of industries do qualify, but they're right. specified service trades or business, which you and I both fall right. into. We don't qualify. Well, still, we, you know, they have the ability to manipulate and. The example I'm going to use is their situation is substantially different from a taxpayer's perspective this year than it will be next year. And their income is high this year that they're going to lose most of that deduction. And they also have the ability to take a capital gain through the sale of a portion of the business either this year or next year. Gotcha. So since they're going to lose the QBI this year, may as well take the capital gain this year because then they still get that deduction next year rather right. than losing it in both years. Here again, it's always evaluating not just 
saving a buck today, mm -hmm. but how do I maximize the tax efficiency by looking at all of your different options? And you know, that's important. Right, and, and uh, to tie it even may maybe a little bit a different way together, that it, what's important is the, the open lines of communication between the taxpayer and the tax advisor and right. the financial advisor because th there are, and, and what I said earlier about the specified service trades or businesses, they, they actually do qualify for the 199A deduction if their total income is below a certain amount. There's always a threshold yeah, right, right, for right. everything. And this is why we're looking at this kind of stuff at this time year end because right. depending on where income is, depending on what industry they are, they may or may not qualify for the deduction. Do you do a lot of year end tax planning like we do? We do. Yeah, okay. Yes, we, we absolutely. Uh, and it's a lot of what we talk about is a lot of the things that we've talked about over this session and the last session. Charitable contribution planning is a big one. Yes. Uh, the retirement planning is, is another big one, but right. absolutely. Right. And yeah, so we're doing a lot of the same thing ourselves. And again, we work more with the individuals. You work more with the business owners and the companies. Mm -hmm. But like I said, all companies, the money ends up ending up on somebody's individual tax return. Correct. And so, you know, and that's what we get. In. So uh, we're about wrapping up. And Brian, this is two great episodes. And I appreciate your insight um, on, on all this stuff. And I think that you could bring a tremendous amount of value to folks. Why don't you do me a favor and take a moment, look in the camera and just kind of tell people how they might be able to get a hold of you. Yeah, so once again, I'm Brian Puglisi, a CPA and a master's in tax. Uh, our firm is uh, GMS Surgeon Gallagher McDevitt Shalor and Surgeon. Uh, I think my, my email and my contact info or my phone number are, are up there, but uh, feel free to you know, send me an email or give me a phone call. I'm happy to answer. If you have a random question, I'm happy to answer it. Or if you think that you might have some tax planning needs uh, and you want to talk to somebody, uh, I'm happy to be available to you. So, Very good. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you. So I hope everybody picked up something. You know, not necessarily all tax laws apply to everybody, but the taxes apply to everybody. And I cannot, under I cannot emphasize enough the importance of tax planning for everyone, okay? You don't have to make a lot of money. The fact of the matter is, is that no matter who you are, tax planning becomes an important component and is integrated in every other facet of all financial planning. And again, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. And you can do it legally and you can do it very efficiently. Just get the right professionals, surround yourself with the right professionals and do it right. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Brian, also for participating. And I look forward to seeing you on our next episode of Financial Planning Explained. And I'm your host, Mike Manager, Certified Financial Planner. Thank you very much. You have a wonderful day and week.